The Hedgehog by Dick Kingsmith, the master of animal adventures. Illustrated by Anne Kronheimer. Part two, chapters four to six. Chapter four. Do you suppose he'll be all right? Said Ma anxiously. It was dawn, and they were about to retire for the day. The children were already asleep in a thick bed of fallen leaves. I should hope so," said Pa. Hodgehog, indeed. His brains are scrambled. Max slept the clock round and halfway round again. He did not stir till the evening of the following day. The shock had sent him into a kind of short, early hibernation. When at last he woke, his sisters rushed to nuzzle at his nose, the safest nuzzling place for hedgehogs. With squeaks of concern, and his parents left their snail hunting and came trotting up. How are you feeling, dear? said Ma. Max considered this. His headache was almost gone, and he was thinking straight. But his speech, he found, would still not behave properly. I'm a bit bitter, thanks, he said. You had a nasty knock, said Pa. You need rest," said Ma. "Why not get back into bed? We will bring you some nice slugs." "I don't want a bed in to get," said Max. "I feel quite wake and wide. In fact, I feel like walking for a go." Pa took a moment to work this one out. Then he said firmly, "You're not going anywhere, son. Do you hear me?" You stay home in the garden for a while. Get your strength back. Understand? Yes, Pa said. Max, I'll say what you do, and he did do what Pa had said for a week or more. Peony, Pansy, and Petunia fussed over their brother. They brought him the fattest, slimiest slugs they could find, and encouraged him to play their favorite game, hide and seek. However, this didn't work. When they hid, Max forgot to go and look for them, and when it was his turn, he forgot to go and hide. So busy was he thinking about the busyness of road crossing. The girls would count to thirty with their eyes shut, but when they opened them, Max would still be sitting there thinking. Striped bits were no good. He didn't intend trying that again, but maybe he thought there were other methods. His determination to find out was increased when Pa came back early one morning from a visit to the park with more bad news. Max overheard him telling Ma. Another one gone, Pa said. Not a relation. Said Ma fearfully. No, said Pa. Chap from Number Nine A, just up the road. I didn't know him well, you understand, but he always seemed a decent sort of hog. He was crossing just in front of me, not ten minutes ago. Misjudged it. Motorbike got him. Leaves a wife and six kids. That evening. Max waited until he was sure that Pa was out of the way, in the garden of Number Five B. The people in Five A always put out bread and milk for Max's family, but the people in Five B often provided something much better for their hedgehogs: tinned dog food. Every evening, 
Pa crept through the dividing hedge to see if he could nick a saucer full of munchy meat before his neighbour woke from the day's sleep. Ma, I'm walking for a go. Ma was quick at translating by now. Did Pa say you could go? she said. No, said Max, but he couldn't say I didn't. And before Ma could do anything, he trotted off along the garden path. Oh, Max, called Ma, are you sure you'll be all right? Yes, of course, said Max. I'll be quite KO. Once outside the garden gate, he turned left and set off up the road in the opposite direction to his previous effort. By now, he was used to the noise and the brightness and confident that he was safe from traffic as long as he did not step down into the road. When a human passed, he stood still. The creatures did not notice you, he found, if you did not move. He trotted on, past the garden of number 9A with its widow and six kids, until the row of houses ended and a high factory wall began, so high that he would not have been able to read the notice on it beside the factory entrance. Max speed, five miles per hour, it said. Max kept going a good deal more slowly than this, and then suddenly, once again, he saw not far ahead what he was seeking. Again, there were people crossing the street. This time, they did not go in ones and twos at random, but waited all together, and then, at some signal, he supposed, crossed at the same time. Max drew nearer, until he could hear at intervals a high, rapid, peep-peep peeping noise, at the sound of which the traffic stopped and the people walked over in safety. Creeping closer still, tight up against the wall, he finally reached the crossing place, and now he could see this new magic method. The bunch of humans stood and watched just above their heads, a picture of a little red man, standing quite still. The people stood quite still. Then suddenly the little red man disappeared and underneath him there was a picture of a little green man walking, swinging his arms. The people walked, swinging their arms, while the high, rapid, Beep, beep, peeping noise warned the traffic not to move. Max sat and watched for quite a long time, fascinated by the red man and the green man. He rather wished they could have been a red hedgehog and a green hedgehog, but that was not really important, as long as hedgehogs could cross here safely. That was all he had to prove. And the sooner, the better. He edged forward until he was just behind the waiting humans and watched tensely for the little green man to walk. <laughs> Chapter 5 What Max had not bargained for when the bunch of people moved off at the peep peep peeping of the little green man was that another bunch would be coming towards him from the other side of the street. So that when he was about halfway across, hurrying along at the heels of one crowd, he was suddenly confronted by another. He dodged about in a forest of legs in great danger of being stepped on. No one seemed to notice his small shape and, indeed, he was kicked by a large foot and rolled backwards. Picking himself up, he looked across and found to his horror that the green man was gone and the red man had reappeared. Frantically, Max ran on as the traffic began to move and reached the far side just in front of a great wheel that almost brushed his back. 
the shock of so narrow an escape made him roll up and for some time he lay in the gutter whilst above his head the humans stepped on to or off the pavement and the noisy green man and the silent red man lit up in turn. After a while there seemed to be fewer people about and Max uncurled and climbed over the curb. He turned right and set off in the direction of home. How to recross the street was something he had not yet worked out, but in his experience neither striped bits nor red and green men were the answer. As usual, he kept close to the wall at the inner edge of the pavement, a wall that presently gave place to iron railings. These were wide enough apart for even the largest hedgehog to pass between. Max slipped through. In the light of a full moon, he could see before him a wide stretch of grass and he ran across it until the noise and stink of the traffic were left behind. Am I where? said Max, looking round him. His nose told him of the scent of flowers in the ornamental gardens. His eyes told him of a strange-shaped building, the bandstand, and his ears told him of the sound of splashing water as the fountain spouted endlessly in the lily pond. Of course! This was the place that Pa had told them all about. This was the park. Hip hip rohey! cried Max to the moon and away he ran. For the next few hours he trotted busily about the park shoving his snout into everything. Like most children, he was not only nosy, but noisy too, and at the sound of his coming, the mice scuttled under the bandstand, the snakes slid away through the ornamental gardens, and the frogs plopped into the safe depths of the lily pond. Max caught nothing. At last he began to feel rather tired and to think how nice it would be to go home to bed. But which way was home? Max considered this and came to the unhappy conclusion that he was lost. Just then he saw, not far away, a hedgehog crossing the path. A large hedgehog. A par-sized hedgehog. What luck! Pa had crossed the street to find him. He ran forward, but when he reached the animal, he found it was a complete stranger. Oh, said Max, I beg your pardon. I thought you were a different hodge egg. The stranger looked curiously at him. Are you feeling all right? he said. Yes, thanks, said Max. Trouble is, I go to want home, but I won't know the day. You mean, you don't know the way? Yes. Well, where do you live? asked the strange hedgehog. Number 5A. Indeed? Well, now listen carefully, young fellow. Go up this path. It will take you back to the street and a little way along you'll see a strange sort of house that humans use. It's a tall house, just big enough for one human to stand up in, and it has windows on three sides and it's bright red. If you cross there, you'll fetch up right by your own front gate. OK! K.O. said Max, and thanks! As soon as he was through the park railings, he saw the tall red house. He trotted up close to it. It was lit up and sure enough, there was a human inside it. He was holding something to his ear and Max could see that his lips were moving. How odd, thought Max, moving very close now. 
He's standing in there talking to himself. At that instant, the man put down the receiver and pushed open the door of the telephone booth, a door designed to clear the pavement by about an inch, the perfect height for giving an inquisitive young hedgehog for the second time in his short life a tremendous bang on the head. <laughs> Chapter 6 Meanwhile, back at number 5A, Pa had a bonanza. Sneaking next door and finding a full saucer of dog food and no sign of his neighbour, he had scoffed the lot. He came staggering back, very full of himself and munchy meat, and fell into a deep, bloated sleep. Ma woke him up just before dawn. Pa, she said, wake up. Max hasn't come back. Pa opened his eyes and saw her worried face and the three smaller but equally worried faces of Peony, Pansy and Petunia. He's been gone all night, said Ma. Oh, Pa, do you think something's happened to him? Pa got to his feet. I don't know, he said. But don't fret, Ma. I'll find him. But he could be anywhere. How are you going to know where to look? Before Pa could answer, he heard a strange voice coming from the hedge that divided 5A and 5B. Excuse me, said the strange voice, and out poked the head of their neighbour. Pa bristled, his spines standing on end. It's that munchy meat, he thought. He's found his empty saucer and he's going to cut up rough about it. Well, I can play rough too. I don't like the look of him anyway, and if he wants a fight, he can have one. We'll soon see who's the better hog. But before he could think of anything to say, the hedgehog from 5B came out of the hedge and said again, Excuse me? Well, said Pa, I couldn't help overhearing what you were saying. Family matter, growled Pa. Exactly. You're worried about your little lad. Oh, cried Ma, have you seen him? Yes, I have. At least I met a young chap in the park who said he was lost and looking for the way back to 5A. Unless, of course, it was a 5A in some other street. Did you notice anything different about him? asked Ma quickly. The neighbour looked a trifle embarrassed. Well, yes, he said, now that you mention it, he seemed to be having a little bit of difficulty with his speech. Muddled some of his words now and then. Like, Hodgehead. Yes, that's our Max, cried Ma. Was he all right? asked Pa. Not hurt or anything? No, he was fine. I told him the best way to go home. He'll be along soon, I'm sure. Try not to worry. Pa cleared his throat awkwardly. <clears throat> his neighbour's kindness greatly added to his feelings of guilt. It's very decent of you, he said. Glad to help. That's what neighbours are for. Can we offer you something, said Ma. Some bread and milk? Oh, no thanks, said the neighbour. I had a pretty good night's hunting in the park. Just as well, because when I got home, I found that something had eaten all my munchy meat. He looked directly at Pa, and his eyes were twinkling. It was a cat, I expect, he said, and back through the hedge he went. Wasn't that nice of him, said Ma, and Peony, Pansy and Petunia chanted, Nice, nice, nice. Pa grunted. A part of him thought that he should confess his sin to his neighbour, but then another part of him, for he was very worldly wise, thought that least said was soonest mended. Life was full enough of headaches without inviting any extra ones. The same thought occurred to Max when at last he came to his senses. 
The door of the telephone booth had knocked him out cold and the neighbour from 5B had not noticed the still, small figure as he hurried to cross the deserted street before the morning rush hour began. Oh, thought Max, has any hedgehog ever had a more horrible headache? The last bang I got made me talk a bit funny and I expect this one's made things even worse. I'd better try saying something. Oh, said Max, has any hedgehog ever had more horrible headache? Max considered this. It sounded fine. Suddenly, he felt fine. Even the headache already felt much less. My name, he said softly, is Victor Maximilian St. George. And, he said more loudly, I have three sisters called Peony, Pansy and Petunia and I live with Pa and Ma at number 5A. And, he shouted at the top of his voice, I am a very lucky hedgehog! And without thinking, without listening, without a single glance to left or to right, he dashed across the street, straight in front of the first of that morning's vehicles, the milk van. The noise that followed was enough to wake the whole street. First there was a screech as the milkman braked and swerved and then came the shattering sound of dozens and dozens of bottles smashing. <laughs> Lastly came the sound of the milkman's voice cursing every hedgehog ever born as he danced with rage in a sea of gold top and silver top of semi-skimmed and skimmed of orange squash and grapefruit juice and fresh farm eggs. Ma and Pa had sent the girls to bed and were waiting up in the growing light of dawn. They were crouching side by side listening when suddenly the dreadful racket burst upon their ears. Sounds like something's got run over said Pa heavily. Brace yourself, old lady. It could be our Max. Ma buried her head and rolled herself into a ball of misery. At that moment, they heard a cheery voice. Now, now, it said, what's all the fuss about? There's no point in crying over spilt milk. <laughs>